It's not a storm, nor a wildfire. One of the most persistent invasions in the U.S. stems from something much smaller. Fire ants. Fire ants now occupy over 300 million acres of land, damaging crops and infiltrating human life. Unlike natural disasters that come and go, their invasion spreads slowly and lingers. As pesticides and technology gradually lose effectiveness, America is forced to seek a different path, using nature itself to fight nature. And from there, a tiny species of fly unexpectedly becomes a key piece in the longest battle against fire ants. Why would a scientific superpower place its hopes on a mere fly? What makes this biological solution a potential turning point in what seemed like a hopeless fight? Terran Works reveals it all in this video. The fire ant invasion didn't unfold with explosions or chaotic scenes. It began quietly nearly a century ago, when tiny ants accidentally arrived in the U.S. aboard cargo ships from South America. No one noticed them. There were no warnings, no prevention plans. Yet America gave this insect the perfect conditions. A warm climate, abundant food, and, most importantly, almost no natural predators. In just a few decades, fire ants spread across more than 300 million acres, from southern livestock farms to densely populated neighborhoods. On each acre they invade, dozens of colonies may exist, each home to hundreds of thousands of ants, operating like a vibrant underground city. The total economic damage caused by fire ants is estimated at over $6 billion per year, a number large enough to rank them among the most dangerous invasive species in the U.S. What's frightening isn't their size, but their speed and resilience. Unlike natural disasters, fire ants don't retreat after a season. They adapt, reproduce, and expand their territory year after year. Every time humans try to wipe them out, fire ants find new ways to survive. And it's that quiet persistence that has turned a tiny insect into one of the most stubborn ecological crises in American history. You know, the fire ant invasion isn't just happening in fields or farms, it's creeping straight into human life. In residential areas across the southern U.S., fire ants show up right in people's yards, on school lawns, and in public parks. One wrong step can trigger hundreds of ants to attack at once. Each year, tens of thousands of Americans are hospitalized due to fire ant stings. For children and those with severe allergies, just a few dozen stings can cause anaphylactic shock. These tiny swarms have forced schools to temporarily shut down, playgrounds to be fenced off, and neighborhoods to spend millions of dollars annually just to keep the ground safe to walk on. Unlike mosquitoes or bees, fire ants don't attack at random. When their nest is disturbed, they respond like a military unit, swarming up clothing, locking on with their jaws, and stinging repeatedly. The greatest fear isn't one ant, it's the entire swarm attacking at once. As the destructive power of fire ants became more evident, humans were forced to take action. Pesticides were spread across fields and neighborhoods. Ant nests were dug up, burned, or flooded in efforts to wipe them out completely. In the short term, these measures gave a sense of victory. The nests disappeared. The ground fell quiet for a while. But that silence didn't last. Soon after, the fire ants returned. New mounds appeared right next to the old ones. When flooded, they linked their bodies into floating rafts, carrying the queen and larvae to safety. When poisoned, the colonies split apart, forming smaller satellite nests, making them even harder to control. Each human attempt to eliminate the ants didn't destroy them, it taught them how to adapt. Chemical treatments also came with another cost. They didn't just kill fire ants, but also wiped out native insects, weakened ecosystems, and forced people to repeat the process over and over. Costs increased, treatment areas expanded, but the end result stayed the same. The fire ants never disappeared. They were only pushed back temporarily, before spreading again. After decades, one truth became clear. Brute force, chemicals, and technology couldn't keep up with the reproductive speed and adaptability of a tiny insect. This battle didn't fail due to a lack of resources, 
but because humans were trying to impose control on a living ecosystem. And from that moment, a question emerged. Why haven't fire ants exploded in numbers in South America, their place of origin? The answer lies in a natural enemy that fire ants have faced over millions of years of evolution. The forid fly, more chillingly known as the ant decapitating fly. Unlike pesticides or poison baits, forid flies don't eliminate fire ants through sheer numbers, but through behavior. The female fly can precisely identify a fire ant among hundreds of insect species. In less than a second, it injects an egg into the ant's body. The larva hatches, grows inside, and eventually kills the ant after several days. But more importantly, during the presence of the fly causes the entire colony to stop foraging, stop attacking, and enter a constant state of alert. Since the late 1990s, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has launched large-scale breeding and release programs for forward flies. Millions of flies were bred in labs and released across southern states. Unlike chemicals that need repeated application, forward flies reproduce and spread on their own. Surveys later showed that in areas where the flies were released, worker fire ant populations dropped by an average of 10 to 15 percent. But the greatest impact came from behavioral change. The ants became less aggressive, their foraging areas shrank, and their territorial expansion slowed noticeably. For the first time in this decades-long battle, humans didn't try to impose total control, but instead worked to restore balance to the ecosystem. The ant decapitating fly doesn't wipe out fire ants, but it did what every previous method failed to do. It made the spread of fire ants no longer unchecked. But right at what seemed to be the most hopeful point, the limitations began to show. While forward flies altered fire ant behavior and reduced worker numbers by 10 to 15 percent, the colonies did not collapse. In fact, the total area controlled by fire ants in the U.S. did not shrink. It remained at over 300 million acres. The invasion had slowed, but it hadn't stopped. The reason lies in an advantage the flies couldn't touch, reproduction speed. Each year, fire ant colonies release millions of queens during mating flights. Even if only a small fraction survive and establish nests, dozens of new colonies are born. Even under constant pressure from the flies, the remaining 85 to 90% of worker ants are still enough to rebuild the colony quickly. Scientists also discovered something else. Fire ants learn quickly. In areas with strong fly activity, the ants began to shift their foraging times, reduce surface movement and avoid open spaces, precisely where the flies are most effective. The flies didn't disappear, but their hunting effectiveness declined over time as the ants adapted their survival strategies. More importantly, forward flies can't kill the queen, the true heart of every colony. As long as the queen lives, the colony lives. After more than two decades of observation, scientists reached a cautious conclusion. The ant decapitating fly is not a killing weapon, but a tool of control. It helps slow the invasion, reduce aggressiveness, and give the ecosystem breathing room. But it cannot end the war. The battle against fire ants forced the United States to accept a hard truth. Not every invasive species can be eradicated, but fire ants aren't the only case. While scientists were still working to control the underground colonies, another threat was quietly approaching, not crawling across land, but drifting along rivers. Asian carp were introduced to the U.S. decades ago with a seemingly harmless purpose, to clean fish farms and control algae. But like fire ants, they quickly escaped human control. With no strong natural predators, rapid reproduction, and a voracious appetite, carp began to dominate major river systems. And now, America's greatest concern is no longer in southern fields, but at the doorstep of the Great Lakes, North America's largest freshwater ecosystem. If Asian carp enter the Great Lakes, the consequences could far exceed a typical biological invasion. They could collapse the food chain, push native fish species to the brink of extinction, and threaten a fishing industry worth billions of dollars annually. Unlike fire ants, carp cannot be controlled with simple chemicals or biological agents. And once they establish a stable population, every effort afterward becomes merely defensive. To stop Asian carp from reaching the Great Lakes, the U.S. has concentrated nearly all efforts on two major lines of defense. 
The first lies in the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, a rare connection point between the Mississippi River Basin and Lake Michigan. Here, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers operates underwater electric barriers, generating constant pulses strong enough to turn the carp away. Alongside this is large-scale harvesting. Thousands of tons of carp are captured each year using nets and specialized vessels, aiming to reduce biological pressure from downstream. No method can fully eliminate the carp. But much like the fire ant fight, they help the U.S. buy time, the most precious resource when facing an invasive species that's dangerously close to the point of no return. If fire ants dominate the land and Asian carp threaten the rivers, then beneath the warm waters of Florida, another invasion is unfolding in silence. Lionfish began appearing in U.S. waters in the late 1980s. At first, they were just a few unfamiliar shapes among the coral reefs. But like fire ants and carp, they quickly defied all expectations. With no natural predators, lionfish reproduce year-round and hunt with astonishing efficiency. A single adult lionfish can prey on over 50 species of small fish and marine organisms, including key species that maintain the balance of reef ecosystems. In just a few decades, lionfish have spread across the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and along Florida's coastline, causing sharp declines in native fish populations. What makes lionfish an ecological nightmare isn't just their numbers, but their speed. A single female can release over 2 million eggs per year, and most of those eggs drift freely on ocean currents, expanding their invasion far beyond any geographical barrier. Chemicals can't be used in marine environments. Biological controls are also unfeasible. And just like with fire ants, once lionfish establish stable populations, all later efforts become focused only on damage control. Faced with this threat, the U.S. can't build fences or isolate regions like it did with carp. The only solution left is for humans to directly join the hunt. Divers are mobilized to manually spear lionfish. Eat the Invader campaigns encourage restaurants to serve lionfish on their menus. This isn't a victory. It's a compromise, turning an invasive species into a resource in hopes of slowing its spread. The battles against fire ants, Asian carp, or lionfish are just the most visible fronts in a much larger conflict. In reality, the United States is facing over 500 officially recorded invasive animal species, with around 300 of them classified as causing serious harm to agriculture, infrastructure, and ecosystems. Each year, the U.S. spends an estimated $120 billion to monitor, control, and repair the damage caused by invasive species. But unlike traditional wars, this one has no victory day. Control programs stretch on for decades, constantly shifting strategies and rarely achieving total eradication. In many cases, success is simply defined by preventing the damage from getting worse. What makes this fight especially difficult lies in the structure of modern society itself. Every year, U.S. seaports handle over 11 million containers, tens of thousands of ships, and hundreds of millions of international passengers. Global trade, maritime transport, tourism, and climate change have unintentionally created biological highways, allowing invasive species to spread faster than ever. A single cargo ship, an untreated wooden crate, or a major storm can be enough to carry a new species across oceans and establish a population within just a few years. As a result, America's strategy has gradually shifted from reaction to prevention. Biological control, early detection systems, strict quarantine laws, and public education are being prioritized over heavy-handed tactics. The fight against invasive species is no longer about eliminating each one individually, but about racing to keep ecosystems from tipping past the point of no return, where every intervention becomes purely defensive. The story of fire ants reveals a hard truth. Even the world's most advanced science and technology cannot easily reverse a biological invasion once it has taken root. A single tiny insect, when freed from its natural checks and balances, can reshape ecosystems and human life for generations. The ant decapitating fly is no miracle. It doesn't destroy the fire ants or end the war. But its presence reminds us of something even more important. In nature, balance is sometimes more powerful than force. 
The fight against fire ants continues, slow, costly, and with no clear end in sight. And now the question is no longer how to eliminate them, but whether we have the understanding and patience to manage the imbalance we helped create. What do you think about the fire ant invasion and the role of biological solutions in this battle? Leave a comment below, and don't forget to subscribe to Terran Works to join us on more discovery journeys ahead.